Hey everyone, welcome to the Gallimorphic Science Podcast, the podcast about science, art, and culture. My name is Tommy, and joining me are my co-hosts, Scott, Raven, and Zach. And today we're going to be talking about a book called The Dinosaurs by William Stout. Actually, to be more accurate, we're going to be talking about two books, The New Dinosaurs, which is a republished version of that, and The Dinosaurs, a fantastic new view of a lost era. But before we get to that, it's been a really hecking long time since the last time we had recorded one of these things. So what's everyone been up to in the meantime? I thought I'll throw to Scott to start us off with. Well, I've been uh, basically reading a lot of short stories from my personal past and short stories I've never, I've never read before. So that's one of the things I've been up to. The collection in particular I've been reading is called Appendix N, which is the eldritch beginnings of Dungeons and Dragons. And it refers to the appendix from the Dungeon Master's Guide published in 1979. And it's a list of stories that have inspired the game. So, yeah. Mm. All right. I really haven't been doing anything in particular. I did read something briefly, and that was to my nephew here a couple days ago when he was visiting. The Paleo Artist Handbook by Dr. Mark Witten, and mainly because I'm, I'm published in there and I wanted to show him the pictures. But it's a wonderful book, and I'm not just saying that just because I'm in it. But it's a... But it is a wonderful book, yeah. It is a wonderful book. It's a great primer for people that want to get into paleo art, but don't really know how to start. Like, how do you draw the animal? What do you base it off of? That kind of thing. So it kind of covers a lot of ground. I think it should have been like two or three volumes myself because there's a lot of subject matter that goes into making paleo art. And this book really only scratches the surface. It's a, a kind of a, like I said, a basic primer. Well, we might get some new volumes in the future. I'm sure if like Mark Witten's up to it, he'll bring out another two or three volumes. Oh, sure. You hear that, Mark? Get on that. Yep, that's <laughs> that's it. That's what you're doing for the next 10 years, buddy. I would recommend this book to anybody who is interested in paleo art or just likes to look at pretty pictures of dinosaurs because it's got tons of stuff from Mark Witten, myself, and a bunch of other paleo artists. There's some uh, Joshua Noop in there, I believe, some Emily Willoughby as well, some heavy hitters like Scott Hartman, of course, because he does a lot of skeletal work. Uh, we may actually cover this book sometime in the future on a future podcast. Oh, yeah, we definitely should. Yeah. I need a copy of that, you yeah. know. All right. Well, we'll uh, see what we can do about that. Maybe we all get together in one house now that we're all vaccinated and uh, hey. record a podcast together some weekend now, right? Hey, and then share the book. Well, maybe not me because like I'll have to fly all the way across the other side to the world to do uh, that. It's okay. We got room. We, we, we got a <laughs> spare bedroom, Tommy. Yes. yes. Come up here. Get vaccinated. Come on, hang out with us. There you go. <laughs> Um, but that's basically been all I've been able to do. I know it's been a heck and long time. I've probably read some other stuff. I'm pretty sure. I think I uh, thumbed through my copy of an Edwardian bestiary, which is a little bit of a selected works from the Detmold brothers who did a lot of pre and post Art Nouveau work. They did a lot of stuff together back in the 1800s and early 1900s and kind of a tragic story there. Maurice and Edward J. Detmold are the names of the brothers. Look them up sometime. They are kind of instrumental in some of my inspiration, as well as this book that we're going to be discussing today. Mm. So that's all I've got to say, Zach. We, uh, what about you? On to you, buddy. Uh, well, I'm still reading that gigantic crocodile book. I read things so slowly that it's probably going to take me the rest of the year to get through it. Ooh, which gigantic crocodile book is this? I, I wish I remember what it was called. It was, <laughs> it's that giant textbook looking book that's like the evolution and physiology of crocodilians. It has a picture of a crocodile looking at you from the water on the cover and it's like 450 pages long and and i read before bed so i typically don't read very much before i conk out <laughs> so it, it is slow going but it is an amazing gorgeous book with tons of wonderful photographs really good easy to understand though technical writing and i'm learning just all kinds of stuff about modern crocodilians and there's even a, a whole section about fossil stem crocodilians Mm. Oh, that's, wonderful. Uh, that's just as, as fascinating. So you get to you get to compare the two a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, those are just, it's, it's a fascinating book. I've wanted it for years, but I finally, my parents got it for me for my birthday last year. They got sick of me asking about it. And they finally got it for me. <laughs> it's a damn crocodile book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, other than that, I haven't, 
I haven't been doing much. I had minor surgery to, uh, that just got my gallbladder out. And that's all. You're a champion, Zach. Yeah. I don't know about that. That's pretty minor surgery. The glue is starting to peel off, which is wild. Oh, ouch. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound like something I particularly want to go through, just any kind of surgical procedure. I don't know, man. I was conked out. They knocked me out. They, they could have <laughs> done whatever they wanted to to me. I was just fine. It's like, what? Now I've got six gallbladders. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and three extra big toes. That's indeed. Very handy. Well, um, seeing how it's been a while since now in the previous episode, I've been writing a few new posts for the Parasite of the Day blog. So one of them is about endovermis, which as its name indicates, is a species of polychaete worm that lives inside the body of other polychaete worms. There's this really weird form of parasitism they've evolved where they essentially slip into the body of other polychaete worm, almost kind of like a body bag, because when you look at the parasitic worm, it's almost as big as the thing that it's infecting. So oh. that's quite a, that's quite something. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I also wrote about a paper that was published in PLOS One quite a few months ago that report on some tiny tapeworms that live in eagle rays. And the thing that is special about them is that they have these little pockets on their body that seem to carry symbiotic bacteria on them. And it's not entirely clear what they use those bacteria for, if anything. So that was interesting. And I also wrote about a species of rather large deep sea leech that have been found in the deep sea of Antarctica, where it parasitizes the Patagonian toothfish, better known to most people as the Chilean sea bass, which is a name that it shares with uh, the Patagonian toothfish, because I guess Chilean sea bass sounds a lot more appetizing to people than like Antarctic toothfish. <laughs> hey, you want some toothfish? Um, <laughs> So, so that's what I've been up to like writing wise, but in terms of like watching wise, well, the last time we recorded, that was like at the end of the fall 2020 anime season and a whole entire season has gone by since then. And we're in the middle of like spring 2021, but there are a few shows that I kind of want to talk about from last season that is kind of relevant to this podcast. Um, I just thought I'd mention that we had the first half of the final season of Attack on Titan because anyone who was watching anime that season would have been watching Attack on Titan. Raven, you really got to catch up because, oh my God. I really do. I am like, <laughs> I, know as well. I, I stopped at like season, what, two? Yeah. Is that when the, the Titan was like coming out of the wall? Sorry, spoilers, yeah. but yeah, that, I thought that was the last season we were going to get and we were going to like yeah. be on that cliffhanger myself. So oh. I kind of got angry and like walked away from it for a while. Oh no, Attack on Titan is such a big, huge thing. The manga is finished now. So um, the ending is kind of like decided. It's just a matter of like waiting for the studio to catch up because, oh my God, like the anime industry scene at the moment in terms of like workload is kind of crazy. And there's a lot of like labor issues involved that I won't go into here, but yeah, MAP has got themselves all booked out. So we'll have to wait until 2022 before we get like the final conclusion. One of the issues is that studio that burned down. What was that last oh, year? Oh yeah, Kyoto Animation. So Kyoto Animation is not involved in any way with Attack on Titan, uh, but they were one of the few studios where they actually have like salaried staff because most anime studios work with like freelance contractors and many of them don't get really paid all that well. So they were one of the good studios that have like fairly good labor practices <laughs> there's all kinds of other like poor labor story and like there was another studio like ufo table that's responsible for making the very very popular demon slayer or as the weebs like to call it commit no taiba they were like they got caught tax dodging so <laughs> Oh. That was like about a year or two ago, but oh there's all kinds of issues there. But the anime that I really kind of want to bring up because it's kind of relevant is free shows. There were like free biology related entertainment show that were airing simultaneously last year. So if you're like a biology nerd, last season was like the season for you. So the free shows are the second season of Cells at Work and also the spin of Cells at Work, Code Black, and another show called Heaven's Design Team. And so uh, Cells at Work is a manga series that's by Akane Shimitsu and the anime is by David Production, who for those who know, they also make JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This show is based on like this manga series that has been stuck at like volume five since 2017. The final volume, which is volume six, only just came out like this year, presumably because the author has been too busy supervising all these spinoffs because 
Oh my God, there are so many sales that work spinoff. I once joked on Twitter that like what, by 2064, there'll be as many sales that work spinoff as there are the number of cells in a human body. <laughs> it is quite <laughs> unbelievable. So the code black is one of these spinoff and like basically the premise of cells at work is that all the cells in your body have been like anthropomorphized into these like anime characters and they carry out tasks in this ginormous city that is your body. And so some people have called it like anime osmosis Jones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure there are like, there's been other shows where you have like little people or anthropomorphized versions of cells inside the body. But in the main series, many of the episodes have this kind of like monster of the week format, because that's kind of the way it is with a lot of these animes that are aimed at a more general and family friendly audience. So they'll fight a thing. So the immune cells get a lot of action because, you know, it's all exciting action comparing with like other bodily functions. So they fight off like bacteria and viruses and parasites. The thing is, is that they do it in a way that is really educational and accurate. I believe the author actually consult with like doctors and people from hospitals to get the information right. So, you know, within the premise of the show, it is still accurate. Like you can actually learn things from watching cells at work. Um, I have actually suggested that maybe anyone who's doing first year biology, especially first year like human biology or about the immune system specifically, because they focus on that a lot. They could like watch a few episodes of cells and work and get a idea of like what adaptive immune system is. What's, what does the B cell do? What does the T cell do? Because the immune system stuff makes for like more entertaining action that gets most of the focus, but they, they do have to do like a few other things as well. Like what platelets do, how, like how do allergies happen and stuff like that. Um, yeah, you can use that as like an educational show. And I think there are like various countries, including China that have like, adopted a versions of cells at work to use for like education in schools oh that's cool so they did like kind of an edited version because for family friendly show there's a lot of blood because <laughs> the blood cells like the immune cells are like these knife wielding dudes and they're like killing bacteria and stuff like that and there's like cartoonish blood it's like watching a kill bill movie to be honest uh. So they made like versions of that show where they just, you know, edit out some of the blood to make it like less gory. But there's a the spinoff of Cells at Work, Cells at Work Co. Black. That is something you definitely don't want to show at a school unless you want to get into really big trouble. Because <laughs> that's the version that is like the gritty, grim, dark, cynical version of Cells at Work. And it deals with a lot of topics that they couldn't really cover in Cells at Work because they need to be family friendly. So basically in cells that work code black, it takes place in a very unhealthy body. Like the poor guy that the body in which cells that work code black takes place in must have like every single possible disease. <laughs> Cause it's got like, you know, smoking and alcoholism, unhealthy diet, kidney stone, gout, sexually transmitted infection, erectile oh. dysfunction, like just everything that could go wrong does go wrong in this body wow the name code black doesn't just refer to the darker tone it also refers to a term in japan called black companies which incidentally are companies that have like really illegal or bad labor practices oh so you got all these cells working in this like really unhealthy body and they're overworked under deteriorating conditions they have like comrades and colleagues who just die or maim in the process of trying to do their job so it's strangely more relatable at first i wasn't really sure about it because it's like oh what a grim dark cells at work what but it actually kind of grew on me because it's like oh wow you know we're all working in this capitalistic hellscape <laughs> this is strangely <laughs> relatable right so yeah it, it's worth watching and um, mind you Episode four did have like, I guess for some people, it might be a little bit off-putting because episode four, they featured gonorrhea. And there's some imagery in this episode that is maybe a bit in bad taste uh, at best and uh, distressing at worst. So uh, you can skip episode four. Basically, um, in Cells of World Code Black, they've gender swapped the white blood cell characters so that the white blood cells, instead of handsome dudes in white overall welding knives they are really buxom ladies in uh overalls welding katanas and the gonorrhea they've decided to represent that with uh tentacle monsters oh god and you know what happens in anime when you put those two things together my goodness so a little bit in bad taste 
but the rest of the show, you know, is worth watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stay away from episode four. I got yeah, it. Just skip episode four because the episode before that is really funny because it's the erectile dysfunction episode. <laughs> And oh, oh my kind god, of a bad bookend! <laughs> oh, that episode. So, the red blood cell, because you got these like dudes who are like they're wearing these red jackets and they're like these Korea type guys, and they're told they were commanded to run down this tunnel, which represents the corpus cavernosum, which is the tissue that runs down the shaft of the penis. Oh, jeez. And they were all being really serious, going like, Oh, we gotta get like someone's gotta get this body to have an erection. <laughs> <laughs> god. It's a, like, it, it, like so that episode is a bit of a highlight because it's, they're talking about like, oh, it's really important. This body needs to have an erection. <laughs> and then at the end, they found out that, you know, the sperm wasn't used for reproduction or something like that. Some people have called it like the Shinzo Abe episode <laughs> because it's got a bit of a every sperm is sacred kind of a tone to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So anyway, that was at World Code Black. A lot of fun if you don't try to take it too seriously. And also, oh my God, watching that show, it would probably make you want to make some lifestyle changes just because of the really graphic way they depict various kinds of diseases and illnesses. Like the Kidney Stone episode that have like this jagged, massive rock thing just tearing down the corridors <laughs> of the urethra. Yeah, it's, it's really something. Uh, so on to something lighter, which is, I think the show that's most relevant for our podcast, which is Heaven's Design Team. So Heaven's Design Team also uh, based on a manga by someone going by the pen name of Hebizu, which I think translate into something like Snake House. This person is also a part-time lecturer at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And so they co-authored this with Suzuki Suda and illustrated by Tarako. And the anime is by Asashi Production, which instantly for my own interest, they are also producing the Girls Frontline anime. The premise is, is that after God created the world and everything, he was like, oh, I've got to create all these animals. That's really tedious. Uh, I'm just going to outsource it to a design team. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the people that get outsourced to like make these animals and stuff like that. And so God is like, like a very typical kind of difficult client because God just give them these kind of like vague prompts to design animals. It's like, can I have an animal that lives in a hot place and eats spiky things? Or like, can I have an animal that like run fast but doesn't have legs? Or uh, <laughs> can I have an animal that like maybe evokes a maternal instinct? And so the members of the design team would then design an animal, so to speak, filtered through their own sensibilities. So for example, one of them likes to make tasty animals. <laughs> so he's the one who makes like crabs and all the other tasty animals and stuff like that. Another one likes elegant and efficient animals. Another one likes cute animals. There's also another character who likes cute animals, but have a unusual aesthetic sensibilities, let's just say. And there's another character who likes very flamboyant looking animals. And so through their kind of sensibilities, they design air quote animals based on these prompts. And so overall, it serves as a really kind of clever premise to talk about like animals and their adaptation, like the physiology and functional structural uh, morphology and all that kind of stuff. They also discuss some very basic physiology stuff like surface area, difference between endothermy and ectothermy. Ooh. Oh, wow. Very cool. And they have a really diverse cast as well. So the thing that they talk about in the show, is kind of reminiscent of what me and my best friend like to call gossiping about animals because we're both biologists or have biology background. And so when we talk about like animals in adaptation, we once said that like, it's like gossiping about animals. And that is literally what the show is like. Uh. And they also have a very diverse cast with a charming character, very gender non-conforming as well. So for example, the rough and tumble engineer is a woman. The big dude is the one who actually likes designing cute animal. They have a representative from hell. So hell and heaven is like, <laughs> they're just kind of like different departments. And the guy from hell is really, really funny because he's like a total chinibio. <laughs> he's dressed in this like goffy chinibio. And he's like a really, really nice guy as well. But every now and then he'll make requests for some like hell animal or something like that. So for those who are familiar with like my own design aesthetic and sensibility, if you watch that show, you would very quickly recognize which of the cast member would be me. So uh, if you want to watch that show, look out for 
the Tommy in the cast member. And uh, it also features a lot of invertebrates as well, which is kind of unusual for a lot of these like zoological entertainment show. Most of them just focus on like large vertebrate animal, most notably like mammals and birds and rarely get looking on other stuff. But they also feature like a lot of very interesting invertebrates. And for those who are keeping score, they also talked about, so Tyrannosaurus Rex does make an appearance. Of course. And those of you who are like taking off the notes is like, did they have feathers or not? Uh, they didn't have feathers on the T-Rex in this particular show. And they did go into the debate about the current discourse surrounding feathers or not on T-Rex. So they didn't have feathers on the T-Rex, not because of like, oh, Jurassic Park, but they did go into a little bit of detail about like the current debates about like whether they have feathers or not is this. So they were pretty up to date and well researched for the show. So uh, I would highly recommend having design team for anyone who likes animals you know like watching nature documentaries watch heaven's design team so t-rex is one of the animals that is featured in the book we're going to be talking about today so without further ado let's talk about this book by william stout all about dinosaurs yeah i love william stout's artwork i just want to come right out and say he's got a good strong almost graphic cartoony graphic appeal to a lot of the stuff he does but he also does some great paintings in here too so Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. I grabbed the wrong book. Hold on a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I guess he did come from a comic background, right? He came from a background of doing comic and fantasy art. Fantasy art, comic background, and I, I think one of his earliest pieces was promotional poster artwork for the movie Wizards. Yeah, I've got three copies, as it turns out, uh, not including the new dinosaurs. Wait, are they three copies of the same book or...? Yeah, about that. Uh, see, I got my first copy used, which is in very loved condition, back in like the early 90s. And the book was published in 1981, so it had been around for a while. Yeah, yeah. And then the second copy I got because we did an auction, one of the silent auctions at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology back in 2013. Oh, yeah. And I was hoping to win this book so that I could see if William Stout would sign it so I could get a signature on it. But I didn't see him after that, even though he was at the conference. Oh, yeah, that was in LA. So uh, that was like his home territories. But the new dinosaurs, the third copy that we have, and I I'm going to bring this up right now. It's I wish I'd had that at that SVP. I just carried around a backpack full of books or something like that and said, oh, hey, Donald Prothero, would you sign this book on fossil mammals? Or here, William Stout, it's great to meet you. Would you sign my book for the new dinosaurs? But uh, William Stout does a lot of dinosaur books, and I've got three of them on my desk right now. I got Dinosaur Discoveries and William Stout's Prehistoric Life Murals. That's a great one. I have that one too. Yeah, we should consider doing that one later on as well. But yeah, I also like the fact that he goes into do a, a, a real Art Nouveau style. Yeah, there's quite a few that has like this kind of very fancy frame. Yeah, absolutely. Not just the framing, the subject matter and the way it's handled. And like Raven mentioned earlier, the Detmo brothers, a lot of the illustrations inside this book match that feel as well. It's sort of Edwardian look. Yeah, very evocative of that early Art Nouveau style because the Detmo brothers themselves were influenced by the Japanese woodblocks. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I believe so, yeah. One of the inspirations for Art Nouveau in general is, is Japanese woodcuts. Yeah. Yeah, after the late 1800s, when we finally got that ship over to Japan, it just kind of opened the floodgates. Yeah, I think that went through like a period where you have a lot of like artists, like avant-garde artists who are really, really taken with Japan. Like, Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. The first of the weeaboos, like one go. <laughs> yes. They're like, Japanese arts are the best. And they have like a collection of their Japanese art prints and stuff like that. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Absolutely. That was a thing. But uh, kind of like how William Stout does it here, they also did more of a, a painterly, I think in this case, it was like watercolor and colored pencil approach. But you can totally see some influence there from the Detmold brothers to William Stout's work. And there's a lot of black and white work in here too. And it, yep. It's just, just incredible, especially the high contrast brush and ink work stuff too. Man, there's not a whole lot I can't say about this book as far as the artwork concerned. Well, let's talk a little bit about our history, so to speak, with this book and how we came across it. So, Scott, you said that you have like three edition of the book, but how did you first initially came across it, Raven? I think if each had their own, I believe my first introduction to William Stout's work was through, believe it or not, the Wizards 
cartoon. And when you say wizards, do you mean the Bakshi movie? Yes. Oh. Yeah, he did the promotional poster for the film. Oh, that's right. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, that poster is better than the movie. <laughs> yes, it is. And we know why, because it's William Stout. <laughs> but uh, that's a little far off topic here. I guess my first foray into this particular book was probably at high school or middle school, because I recall that we had a fairly good library at both. And it was fairly well stocked with big, nice coffee table art books like, well, William Stout's work and some other things, which surprised me considering, you know, Wassail, Alaska. We're kind of famous for having Sarah Palin, who a lot of people don't know, went through a phase in the 90s where she outlawed dinosaurs, including Barney, at all public buildings <laughs> in Wasilla. So yeah, she was mayor at the time. She was mayor of Wasilla at the time. Anyway, for some reason, we managed to keep those dinosaur books there at the library. I think maybe because it was in an art section, right? And it was mm. more seen as like an art thing than a science thing. So they kind of let it slide, I guess. Uh -huh. That is so bizarre to me. The idea of like the whole banning dinosaur, I can understand the creationist agenda, but like Barney, because Barney is so abstracted from what a dinosaur actually looked like. You can barely recognize Barney as a dinosaur. <laughs> like it's a cartoon animal kids show mascot that bear very little resemblance to any dinosaur, really. Exactly right. And, but I guess it was just she saw it as a way to indoctrinate children. Like, here's some devil stuff. <laughs> the evolution. We can only indoctrinate kids to what I like and believe. Right. Absolutely. I mean, wh when I hear you say Sarah Palin, I just had this whole thing. It was just like take a long drag of cigarette. It was like, I haven't heard that name for a long time. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a name I've not heard for a long time. There we go. Actually, your experience with the book is um, loosely comparable to mine because I kind of first came across it as also a teenager and I found it in the local public library out of the, I guess, six or seven dinosaur books that they had in their collection. It left quite an impression on me because the artwork in there are very distinct. All the dinosaurs in there are really grungy and grimy and wrinkly. It, they all look like they've lived a life comparing with like many of the other reconstructions in other dinosaur book where the dinosaur looks like really really clean they look more like models as opposed to these william stout dinosaurs which are like just so they, they just they just grimy and wrinkly and grim and gross yeah 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 exactly which is like how wild animals are that's kind of one thing about paleo art that i would like to see a bit more of because many of the paleo uh, like reconstruction even to this day that I see I can understand if it's like a, a press release for new species and stuff like that but just paleo art in general many of the animals are so like clean and immaculate which is yeah. totally not reflecting of my experience with wild animals which is like all of them's got you know ticks hanging off their face they got scars they got all kinds of stuff going on with them because they lived life out in the wild you know, you only catch a glimpse of an animal out in the wilds or, you know, most people only have experience with animals in zoos, which are very well taken care of. Yeah. I can totally understand why, you know, you have the inclination of not drawing, you know, grunge. And I do think this, this book inspired me to add a little more grunge and grit to my work too. I don't always do it, but I try to, especially with like theropods, because they're like the sharks of the terrestrial Cretaceous, you know, yeah. especially tyrannosaurs. Well, when you look at like lines and stuff, you look at like the face and they often got scars. Sometimes they'll have like a porcupine quill stuck in the side of their face because that's how they attack things. So you would expect like a T-Rex to have all kinds of like scars and gnarled stuff going on with their faces because of just the life that they live. Yeah, that's how they say hi. They bite each other's faces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why Sue is the way she is because she got her face bit a lot. That's true. So, Zach, how did you come across the book first? I actually am not sure. I've, I've had the soft cover copy for ages, and I don't remember where I got it. I probably got it from Tidal Wave, you know, a long, long time ago, back when they were in their first store. But I love it to death. And I think this book really got me into, of all things, the Age of Reptiles comic by Ricardo Delgado. Right. And there's a lot of similarity in the style, because both of these guys, William Stout and, and Ricardo Delgado, they make characters and like you were saying tommy all these animals look like they've they've been through some shit 
And all of these pictures in this book, I mean, they're all telling a story. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a single picture of an animal just standing there, as you so often see in Paleoart, uh, except this rather retro Spinosaurus over here in the middle of the book. Uh, there are no page numbers, so I can't uh, give you page numbers. Wait, there's not? No. <laughs> Yeah, there, there isn't. I, I was like taking notes of it last night and I was like, oh, I better not know which page number. And it was like, oh, no page numbers. <laughs> so I'm the only one who noticed that. Oh my God, I just noticed <laughs> Yeah, wow, yes. I will say that that I was first exposed to William Stout's art in the Dinosaurs Past and Present volumes from way back when, because he's got a few illustrations in there, including one that's in here. And it's, it's one of my favorite pieces of paleo art ever. It's this little Camptosaurus hiding behind a giant boulder in a windstorm. It's just so evocative. Yeah, I've just always liked his, his work since. This is my only dinosaur-specific William Stout book. His murals, of course, have all kinds of different animals in them. But I picked up a second copy, my hardcover copy of this book, at Tidal Wave a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a great book. So Dinosaur Past and Present, it just reminded me of this other book that was at the local library that also had some William Stout's work called The Ultimate Dinosaur. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, it's, it's not really a dinosaur book so much as a series of short stories. Yeah, because that one also included some artwork by Wayne Barlow, which for listeners at home, you can check out our talk about Wayne Barlow's work in episode three. Links in the show notes. Yep. (laughs) I found that this book actually was published uh, during kind of an interesting time in terms of like paleo art and dinosaur science, because it originally came out in the wake of the dinosaur renaissance. So, you know, from lumbering dinosaurs being viewed from before the dinosaur renaissance to after the influence of Robert Backer at all being these kind of like hot-blooded beasts, but also before Jurassic Park, the movie came out. Yeah. So it's kind of in this really interesting period where it was before basically Jurassic Park, I guess, uh, indoctrinated the general public's image of what a dinosaur looked like. So there was like this kind of grace period where it was I guess more free in terms of like how people perceive dinosaur because it was after the public started changing its mind about dinosaurs, but before a big movie like Jurassic Park came along and tell everyone like, this is how dinosaur look like from now on. You're not going to change your mind for the next 20 years. <laughs> and, and what I find fascinating is that this book came out in 1981 and Dinosaur Heresies came out in 1986. Yeah, and Predatory Dinosaurs of the World came out in 88. Yeah, so this book is really forward thinking for yeah, its it time. Is shrink wrapping of some of the animals a lot of the animals most of the animals aside just the way that it depicts dinosaurs in in posture their activity level i guess if you were to date the dinosaur renaissance that would probably be a thing that took place during the 70s and the book dinosaur heresies the main book that popularized the idea that was being published during that particular period of time came out in 1986. So it was kind of at the wake of it when it finally reached public consciousness of dinosaurs being hot-blooded active beasts as opposed to being these like lumbering, dumb, lizard-like things. I've been meaning for a while to figure out, this is something I've had in my head for a blog post for years, but trying to figure out the kind of sequence, the steps that the dinosaur renaissance went through and the dates of each major change and ending with where it came into public consciousness in a big way. I would kind of argue that it didn't come into public consciousness until Jurassic Park. But in the paleo art and professional paleontologist community, it had certainly been an idea that had been roiling around for around 20 years. Now, is that 20 years prior to Jurassic Park coming out, Zach? Yes. Yeah, when I said public perception, I might have like broadened a little bit too much. Maybe anyone who was outside of like the handful of academics who are studying scientists and stuff into the people who are actually depicting artwork. But I guess it's also kind of linked with public perception simply because of people like William Stout and other paleo artists are ultimately, I guess you could say the arbiter of how dinosaurs look like to the general public because the general public's not going to look up papers to read about dinosaurs. They'll just see it in books like this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. When people look up a new dinosaur discovery, the first thing they look for is the accompanying artwork that goes with it. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I'm totally something I do for sure. Even if I'm looking at a paper, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'll go straight to the figures where just show me what the animal looks like first mm-hmm. so I can understand what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, show me that acetabulum. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, it's only a partial acetabulum. Well, damn it. <laughs> 
it's a little fracture of a notion of, of an acetabulum. <laughs> Table flip. Table flip. Yes, that's Zach. Every time a new dinosaur comes out and it's based on like a little finger bone or whatever. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say that like you look at the press release and it'll be like a whole ass dinosaur doing its thing. And then you find out it's like, oh, it's based on a partial hit or something like that. You know? yep. <laughs> it happens quite a lot, even with like one that is described by someone at my university, which is a, it was a relative of Ostrovenator. Rapator? No, it's a different one. It's like Julius Satoni did a whole I should know the name. Actually, I don't think they gave it a name because they, they didn't have enough for formal description. So it's called like Lightning Ridge Claw or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The Lightning Ridge Mega Raptor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah, have a name yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. Julius Satoni did like the art with it. I believe the fossil is opalized. Yes, yes, Ooh. yes. But yeah, they have like a whole 3D printed skeleton in the Natural History Museum we have there at the university. But I guess many people don't look at the little plaque that shows like, okay, here are the little bits that are actually <laughs> known about this whole damn thing. Right. I have taken like photos of various different parts of this reconstruction just for reference for artwork that I've done. But yeah, it's funny that this whole thing is like based on that. And if they find more new material of this animal, then they might have to revise that old skeleton. <laughs> right. So that is actually kind of what I like about this William Stout book too. This is, if something is only known from a few parts, sometimes he just shows the animal as those parts attached to a body, of course. But like, there's one particular picture in here where it's like this animal was only known from a partial skull. So he has a magnolia flower covering up most of what's not known. And because he has a propensity shrink wrap, unfortunately, it's easy to tell which parts are known. Almost to an Ellie Kish level. Oh, right. Just yeah. a bit. And I, I do think that, that she was an influence too. I, I can't imagine you're wrong, you know. I, I'm just thinking of that particular painting with the Quetzalcoatlus flying over the huge herd. The living skeleton. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> you mean the heap of bones <laughs> that somehow managed to get airborne? Yeah, that was quite striking. <laughs> Although I have to say in the new edition, you can see that in his new artwork, he has like definitely moved away from that. And so the new artwork, it's very distinct because A, it's not shrink wrap and B, the line work is also a little bit more, I guess you could say controlled. It's more fine. But Zach, you mentioned that the dinosaurs are like often doing things, which makes them more interesting in William Stout's work. And also, I guess they're doing things that aren't just like fighting or eating each other, which is another kind of trope that is in a lot of paleo art. You have a lot of these dinosaurs that are doing things that are not as often depicted up to and including like taking a dump. <laughs> yep i thought that was a very interesting choice and like but worth depicting because it's like well that's what animals do they are shit making machines and we have copper lights so you know that's yep where they come from kids yeah yeah all those rainforests in south america yep they were seeded by big old sauropod turds <laughs> So yeah, having them like doing things that aren't just like fighting each other, also like, you know, scratching themselves. He had a whole bit, which is just off different dinosaurs scratching themselves against rocks, against mud, against sand, or against a tree. It shows a more well-rounded depiction of life of these animals other than just either standing around or fighting each other. Because I find that that gives people like having depicting dinosaurs doing only those things, i.e. fighting each other or standing around, it kind of makes people kind of think of them more as like movie monsters rather than actual animals. And that leads to like certain other things. I've seen online people having like weird perception about both dinosaurs and the field of paleontology in general that I won't go into here. Yep. Right. We could do a whole episode on that. We might, but yeah. There's a picture early in the book of a sauropod in the water, swimming in the water, being chased and attacked by swimming theropods. Mm -hmm. And I had always thought that was a Greg Paul concept because he has that exact same image in Predatory Dinosaurs. Yes, that's right. But it's here first, which was fascinating to me. 
Oh, yeah. Well, I guess Gregory S. Paul's one is also, I've talked about this at this Science in a Club event thing, but it's also, I called it like an illustration, which is also a shitpost because of the way that he titled it, which is what happens when Apatosaurus Ajax tries to escape from Allosaurus by fleeing into the water. Yep. Which is to say like, well, it wouldn't work anyway. So those ideas about them fleeing into the water to escape from Predator are dumb. It's kind of almost like a shit post in illustration form. <laughs> I, I think that Greg Paul picture, I believe I saw that one actually before I saw the William Stout illustration when I was a, a kid. Oh, I know I did. And I believe that one right there, more than Jurassic Park or anything else, was the most responsible for me changing my view on dinosaurs being lumbering, dumb critters. Mm. After that, I was like, you know what? That makes more sense than this big, huge tail dragging thing that people talk about being a dinosaur. Yeah. I think when I was like a kid, I watched this documentary, which featured a lot of the work by, well, not just the work, but like interviews with Jack Horner and Robert Backer and the dinosaur renaissance guys, so to speak. And I think that was the thing that ultimately led me to read Dinosaur Heresies. Mm. And so, yeah, I can't remember the name of that documentary. Was it hosted by Christopher Reeve, aka Superman? can't remember they didn't have a specific host they have like a narrator but they have like series of interviews and stuff like that the narrator's voice is very distinct but yeah it's on like a vhs tape somewhere that i've taped off the tv and watched like a lot uh somewhere in my parents garage i'm sure i've done the same thing yeah so uh it was that and also another documentary that was like particularly influential just to show you the age of the documentary, I think that might actually have Chinese subtitles, which indicates I might have recorded it in like Hong Kong. But I'm not sure. I can't remember. My memory of that is particularly hazy, aside from like a few very selected imageries from it. But yeah, that was probably around about the time when I considered like, oh, dinosaur, maybe they're like active and stuff like that. Did the William Stout version of that painting come out first? The Allosaurus chasing the Patasaurus? It must have. It's in this book, 1981. Yep, 1981. I give you a page number, but... There aren't any. Yeah, maybe because in my brain, the Greg Paul version came first. Was that in the carnivorous dinosaurs of the, or carnivorous, what, fair parts of the world or something like that? Predatory dinosaurs of the world, yeah. Yeah. Another book I have two copies of. <laughs> Yes, three copies. Wait, are we? Do we have three or four copies of William Stout's The Dinosaurs, hon? Uh, we have three, including the new dinosaurs. Very good. Because I think I took one copy back to Tidal Wave. We had four, that's right. We had four, but we didn't need four copies of this book. <laughs> I wouldn't think so, unless you're like stocking, like unless you stop piling them like stonks or something like that. So, yeah. Invest, <laughs> invest in Stout. <laughs> So now I'm curious, what is the new dinosaurs compared to just the dinosaurs? Well, it has some new artwork and it also has like a few corrections and updated notes on one of the last pages of the book. They also have, you know, some information about this new edition. So it's basically an updated edition with some new artwork as well. Okay. And the new artwork looks really, really good. So I don't know what your inclinations are in terms of like how much money you're willing to spend, but it might be worth it just to get some of the new artwork. I'm looking at Amazon right now. It's $21 paperback. I kind of like the way they handled this because they, they didn't edit the book itself. They just bookended it with additional art and updates. Oh, interesting. And I really appreciate that, that they didn't try to pick it apart and add some new stuff, just kind of shoehorn it in there. Yeah. All around solid book. I like it. I like the feel of it, the heft of it, everything about it. Kind of hoping that the glue holds out because my experience with these kind of soft cover art books is they never last very long, especially in my hands. <laughs> well, my one came kind of like um, slightly water damaged. Oh, only slightly because it was very strange. I have like ordered books from the book depository for like probably about 10 years. I've never had this happen before. I think I posted photos on our Discord, but like when the packaging came in, it was like all wrinkly. And thankfully the cover was made out of material that wasn't, it was like, I wouldn't say completely water resistant, but for the level of exposure they got, it wasn't too heavily damaged. But because when Book Depository send your book, it's slipping these like promos for all the 
audio books and stuff like that. That stuff got like stuck onto the back of the thing. So I have to like peel it off. And Ugh. so there's still bits and pieces of this like promo stuff that are stuck to the back of the book. And the back cover is like slightly wrinkly. So it was like slightly watered down. Never had that happen before. I don't know what, did it got dropped in the rain on the way? Yeah. So he slammed it in the door of the airplane as they uh, took off. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Or like chucked it in the wrong place where it got like surrounded by clouds or condensation. I don't know. It looked like it got dropped into like the ocean, honestly. Somebody yeeted it right off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've never had that happen to before and I haven't had that happen to me since, thankfully, but... Yeah, my copy of this book is like slightly water damaged, but not to the degree where the artwork inside is affected, thankfully. But yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit wrinkly. Got uh, a really decent copy of the new dinosaurs, and we have Scott's really loved version, and then a new version that we can keep kind of on the shelf and continue reading Scott's version, just to keep it nice. Right. My version has so well loved. I used to have a, a trilobite stamp, an ink stamp that I would put in my books. And even though trilobites were around during the Mesozoic, uh, I've got a trilobite stamp on, on my copy. So well loved. I'm just thinking of like two other dinosaur book that is like really, really worn down from maybe when I was a kid. So I think one of them would be the National Geographic edition where they had the Sorolophus on the cover and it was all about dinosaurs. Oh yeah. That one got really, like my copy of it was really worn down because I carried it everywhere and looked through it all the time. The other one is probably when I was like in primary school and I was my first like adult novel, as in like, I think went through a phase where I read like young adult books. I basically went from reading like kids pictures book to like reading your usual kind of like novel. And the first novel that I read because of dinosaurs was Jurassic Park. Course. And I always like took it with me to class. And yeah, that copy is so worn out. Like it's so heavily worn out. And I also picked up another copy of The Lost World at this like used book sales thing that was in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, there's this theater where every year they have like $2 books or something like that, where people just offload all of the secondhand book and they sell it to raise money for the theater. And I came across a copy of The Lost World that I bought just for lols, literally, because <laughs> in the front, it was signed like it was someone's Father's Day gift. And obviously, you know, something happened and the father decided to like sell off this book. I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want it. He probably read it. Yeah, he probably read it and go, eh, you know, but uh, I just thought that was funny. So that's why I picked up that copy. And it was like two, what, a dollar or two dollars. It was like... <laughs> That's funny, you know, in a <laughs> bizarre kind of a way. I have like a weird sense of humor when it comes to these kind of stuff. Like, especially when you come across like secondhand stuff that like it was a gift to someone. It was like a very heartfelt gift to someone. And then you find it at like a secondhand place. Right. Like, oh, something went wrong there. There's a story behind this. <laughs> it's like, that is so sad. Yeah, yeah. I, I love, I, it's kind of morbid, but I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> Oh my God, Tommy, it's, it's a little more videos. Yeah, it shows the book has a history too. I mean, somebody else handled it and gifted it, obviously, and possibly read it and then discarded it. Yeah, I've, I've gotten all kinds of like weird books from that particular book sale. One of them, it was like this recipe book full of the worst recipe ever. It was like the New Zealand Women's Weekly. <laughs> um, it was like done in the 1970s. And the recipes oh. are like, as you would expect, like they all sound really terrible. The color of like the photograph is just like really heavily exposed red. All the photos look really off-putting. All the recipes are totally off-putting. And also they have these weird artwork that are done in such a way that you don't really know exactly what they're supposed to be. It's like, is that a fry egg or is that supposed to be like a UFO? <laughs> and they seem to have these clip art of like different kind of artwork which they mash together in different combinations so i remember these like tiny little fry egg looking things that are they fry eggs or are they something else they look like tiny flying saucers <laughs> and this is one where it's like a fish resting on a whole bed of these little tiny flying saucers and it was like is this fish being abducted by tiny aliens like 
<laughs> okay. The whole book is just this weird. So I bought that for five dollars just once again for lols. Fried eggs on fish. Oh my god. Well, that's not what the recipe is. <laughs> but they just got like a bunch of clip art. <laughs> And they just mashed them together, like random stuff in like these artwork that has nothing to do with the actual recipe alongside with these oh my God. really bad photographs of like just really unappetizing stuff. Um, I don't know where I put that book, but like, yeah, this stuff, it's very typical of that particular era. You know how when people put everything in jello? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that era of like when people were trying to make, say, Chinese food and put their own spin on it, and it sounds really, really terrible. Any kind of like non, I guess, white people food, uh, and they put their own spin on things, and it sounds really unappetizing. Now, now, when you say your own spin, do you mean things like spam or? Yeah, spam feature quite a lot in many of these recipes. Oh, oh. my. Ugh. And also other things that you think like, oh, or like mayonnaise or just, <laughs> yeah. but like, yeah, I, I bought that book for $5 just because it was so like, I just looked at it and go, oh my God, everything about this book is just, it's like when we were talking about movies that are like so bad that it's good. It's like that, but in like book form. <laughs> Because everyone put in their, like, your favorite recipe. Oh, this has been, like, passed down through family and stuff like that. And they submit it to this, like, women's magazine. And they compiled it together into this, like, really ugly-looking book <laughs> with really weird, ugly-looking artwork that is really difficult to decipher. Well, I guess we have to publish these. We had to ask for them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's just a bunch of bored housewives throwing darts at, like, random ingredients and going, yep, this is what I'm making my food out of. That's what, yeah, like, that's what it seems like. And all the photos I have are, yeah, really unappetizing. Like, that was, like, a bad era of food photography. When you look at food photography now, it's all, like, really nice and appetizing. But back then, it was, like, I don't like, raw cut, like, chicken, like, a raw chicken with slice of lemon on it or something like that. Oh it was God. supposed to be, like, <laughs> just before it goes in the oven. It's just weird. Like, the, all the stuff in there is just weird and unappetizing. And I absolutely love that book. Now that I, like, started thinking about it, it was like, oh, man. Eldritch horror recipes. Yeah, that was totally worth the five dollars that I spent on like procuring <laughs> this book at this like book sale. It was five New Zealand dollars too, so for you guys, like next to nothing. I buy books like that from like that book fair. It will either be books that genuinely interest me or books that I just buy for lols. One of the weirdest collection books of books that I managed to pick up from that book sale for very very low prices was like, multiple volumes of textbook about Arbo viruses. Arbo viruses are viruses that are transmitted by arthropods. But this is like academic books. Usually, like if they're on sale, they'll be $100 each or something like that. Oh my God. <laughs> you found a treasure trove of like these textbooks then? Or yeah. just the one? Oh, just that one. It was just like, oh, I'm interested in like infectious stuff. This is about these viruses that uses arthropod as vector. Sure. Um, I don't know what I'll do with them, but I'm sure I'll like read them at some point. So I picked up like seven volumes of this series of books about Arbo viruses. They're still on my bookshelf. They're one of my favorite things because they're academic books that I picked up for probably a tenth or less of the original price they must have been selling it for. I've also come across people's like PhDs and master thesis. What? Which is a very strange thing to be selling at like a used book fair. Yeah, it is. It was a strange collection of books. I think people just like donate whatever it is that they have for this like book sale thing. And I have some fond memories of that Dunedin book sale. Do we have anything more to say about dinosaurs or the new dinosaurs? Well, if any of our listeners doesn't have it, they should seek it out because it's really good. Definitely. It's definitely worthwhile, you know, just for the art alone. But there's, there's a lot of information in these books, too. And I think even for people who aren't like super big into dinosaurs, it's still like a really cool collection of artwork. And it's very different from the usual kind of dinosaur book because each of those artwork has like little stories that goes with them. So that's also really worth like reading. So for example, one of my favorite stories on there would be, I actually wrote down a list of like my favorite artwork versus like favorite stories from uh, the books. And I think 
there's this one, uh, it didn't have a name. I just mentally called the chase, but it was like a series of different archosaurs that are chasing each other throughout geological time. That like, you know, in the Cretaceous one, it was like, a, I think it was a Displetosaurus chasing a Corypheosaurus. And then in the Triassic one, it was like some kind of Psilophysid chasing a juvenile Poposaurid. I thought that was like a really interesting series of story, just showing the persistent pursuit of like predator and prey throughout evolutionary time. And also the one about the Ophnelia, which is trying to chase down this little dragonfly called A Difficult Dinner. So I really like some of these stories. So I have like, you know, a list that I've compiled of favorite artworks and like favorite stories. Actually, what would be some of your favorite artworks from the book, each of you guys? Uh, let's see. I, I think if, if each had their own, the center spread with the, looks like Dinosuchus taking down an Edmontosaurus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's probably one of my absolute favorite. And I think the other one is probably the one talking about allergens, where it's the little Ornithischian dinosaur underneath the magnolia tree. And he's standing among a bunch of, here it is, flowers is the name of the section. Just hold it up to the microphone. Yes, I'm holding it up to the microphone now. It's underneath a magnolia tree. Yeah, just everything about it. The floral border really kind of inspired me as an artist to really kind of pay attention to like flowers and plants too. I do remember seeing this as, you know, a kid growing up. Man, I should try to do more stuff like that because beforehand I was just doing things on like blank backgrounds. Sometimes I would do a background every now and again, but it was like more to humor the person going, you should draw more backgrounds. I, I think I have several favorites at this book like Raven does, but man, I think I'm going to settle on and just talk about the page opposite insects. Oh, yes. With the uh, ornithalestes and all the insects are keyed out so that you can, you can see which ones are which. It's the one that strikes me the, as one of my favorites anyway. I think one of my favorite would be Warm Weather, which is the one with the Coryphosaurus and all these other animals, which have like living relatives like possums and storks and all those other animals that are in the background. Well, not so much background. They have the Coryphosaurus on one side and then all these other animals on the other. But that one is just like really vibrant and lively. I think that's kind of one of the things I appreciate the most about William Stout's dinosaur work, which is like, they all just look so alive. Yeah, I think that's definitely it too. You know, hey, there's there's a bowfin fish right there. I just noticed, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm looking at the same spread now. And I do kind of see where William Stout's work, I would think also influenced the dinosaur renaissance in more ways than we like to give him credit for, I think. You know, this predates Dinosaur Revolution, which came out on Discovery Channel, what, in 2012? Was that when that came right, out? I, I can't think remember so. now. That was a while ago. That was a while ago, but, uh, you know, this predates that by a couple decades, at least. Yep. 1981. 1981, the year of my birth. And I, you know, I like to say that my work is inspired a lot by Roger Dean, who has a similarly bright color palette, but I think William Stout kind of deserves a little bit of that credit, too. What about you, Zach? Which is your favorite piece from the book? Well, my favorite is, is, of course, the big boulder. Cool weather? Uh, yeah, cold, cool weather. But my, my second favorite is the disease picture of this very oh, sick dying wow. triceratops. Yeah, yeah. Which you don't really see very much in uh, paleo art. Yeah, he looks like he's having a hard time. Yeah, he does that really well. Yeah, it's black and white. That's actually one of the things that I really appreciate about some of his artwork. Another one that's on my list is, is the Friends one, the one where it's just a tyrannosaurus or a whole flock of these pterosaurs that are picking out leeches and stuff like that. Oh, yes. I think that was in like in close proximity in the book with the dinosaurs scratching themselves and also these pair of psilophyses that are scratching themselves of like ticks and stuff like that, which is once again, it's reflective of my experience of wild animals, which is like they, they have things living on them and irritating them all the time. <laughs> Right. And the things that happen because of it, nodules and, and scars and basically life. Yep. Life. Right. And I think that's really what, what speaks to all of us here about William Stout's work is it's very lifelike in ways that, like you said, Tommy earlier, some other art is not, even if it is shrink wrapped, you can still appreciate it for being kind of innovative and very lively. A product of its time for sure. 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. Anything else about the book? Yeah, I think that's all pretty much I really have to say. I'm really glad that we got an opportunity to talk about this book. Yeah, yeah me, me too. too. Uh, I look forward to talking about more William Stout books. Maybe we'll get together and talk about not the ultimate dinosaur, but the, what is that other dinosaur book we have, honey? Oh, uh, Dinosaur Discoveries. That one, yes. Oh, okay. Kind of fast forward to his uh, newer work. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, I guess if no one else have anything else to say about William Stout's work, we'll close out this episode. Thank you for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.